Hello, my name is Ryan from Buster Beagle 3D, and today I'm going to show you how I perform the ultimate torture test on the X-Tool F1 Ultra by using it to create an aluminum mold for the Buster Beagle 3D injection molding machine. So how did I do it? And should you? Well, let's find out. Okay, so spoiler alert, right off the bat, I realized before I even took on this test that this was certainly not the most efficient way to carve an injection mold into aluminum. I have a CNC machine, so I know what I'm going to show you could have been done with the CNC, but potentially not all of it. I also wanted to point out that this F1 Ultra is by far not the most powerful fiber laser that I own, but it does have one feature that made me want to use this machine over my others, and that is the descending Z height adjustment while engraving. So let me back up real quick and explain what is happening here. Everybody by now has probably seen videos and reviews where fiber lasers have been used to 3D engrave on brass coins. I had used the F1 Ultra to already achieve this, so this is really nothing new. This is achieved by using a height map from a 3D model to create slice layers in the Xtool Creative Space software that will layer by layer engrave that height map onto the surface. Much like a slicer works on a 3D printer, where the model is built up layer by layer, this is just the inverse of that process. However, with coins, you are typically only ever going to engrave down a few millimeters at most. With the part that I wanted to make, I knew that I wanted to engrave down to at least 20 millimeters or three quarters of an inch. The first thing that I did was run a few tests to figure out if I could even engrave down that far. So the first thing I needed was a model. I quickly modeled up this stepped object just so I could measure how the laser was engraving into the surface of the aluminum. After I had the 3D model, I used a free online program to convert that 3D object STL file into a height map. I first tried to engrave with my more powerful 60 watt COM marker fiber laser using Lightburn, but as you can see here, it really was lacking to give me the results that I wanted. The reason for this is that the deeper the engraving goes, the more out of focus the laser becomes. The COM marker B6 has autofocus, but has no way of adjusting that focus during the job. The second issue is that Lightburn, as far as I can tell, has no height adjustment value that even if I could hook it up to the motor of the COM marker B6, there is no way to tell it to move during the job. Now, I understand that I could have engraved a little bit and then moved the laser head down and engraved a little bit more, but that's hard to manage and may introduce odd transitions between the moves on the final product. That was the main reason I switched over to trying to see if it could be done with the F1 Ultra. There is a setting in Xtool Creative Space that would allow you to lower the laser head by whatever increment you want after X number of layers. So from the beginning to the end of the process, I can lower the height of the laser by tiny increments each layer. I ran a bunch of tests and finally came up with the values that I needed. Using the fiber laser, I'm using the embossment process with 256 layers, 256 being the highest number of layers that you can choose. I ran this at 100% power and 300 millimeters per second at 280 lines per centimeter. Now, even though you can only run 256 layers, which means how many layers the slicer will slice your height map into, you can run those layers for as many passes as you want. So I ran each layer for eight passes. So if you multiply the number of layers, 256, by the number of passes, eight, you end up with the number of actual passes in the job, which was 2,048. I told you this was a torture test. I then told the laser to descend the Z axis every one layer or pass by 0 0.01 millimeters for each layer. That meant that by the time this was done lowering, it would move the laser down 2,048 times 0 0.01 millimeters, which is 20.48 millimeters, which was just half a millimeter more than I wanted, so it was perfect. So I ran this test right under the laser head, but it brought up another issue to consider, and it, it seems that part of the embossment process inside of Xtool Creative Space tapers the model the deeper it goes into the surface. 
This was confusing to me at first, but then it kind of made sense. The issue is that the fiber laser is what is called a galvo laser, which means that the laser head doesn't move, but tiny little mirrors inside it does, which move the laser around your work area. This means that the deeper the model goes, the more potential the laser has to not be able to reach that spot from a central point above. So the model tapers in. I even tested this one more time where I moved the exact same file all the way over to the left and tried it again. You can see that the further away the model is from the center of the laser, the more it tapers from the side closest to the laser. Oddly enough, the section to the extreme left has less of a taper as it is closer to the bounds of the workable area. So with all of this knowledge, it was time to make my mold. I modeled this cell phone stand in Autodesk Fusion 360 for my tests. Again, I'm making an injection mold for my Buster Beagle 3D injection molding machine, so the model needed to be made taking injection molding principles in mind. I won't go too much into those, but the mold needs to not have any undercuts and everything has to have draft angles. Essentially, think of it like an ice cube tray where if I was to pour water into it, would I be able to remove the ice after it was frozen? That's the same principle of injecting the mold with hot plastic. Once it cools, you're going to want to be able to remove it from the mold. So with my model finished, I made a cavity of that model, which is the negative of it, so I can fill it with plastic to make the final product, which would be the positive. I then ran that model through the same free website to make the height maps, so I would have the image that I can import into Xtool Creative Space. Then using the same settings as before, I ran this aluminum mold, I already machined the specs that I needed for my machine, and then I started waiting a very long time. Now, two other things I did while I waited was to add a fan on the inside of the machine, blowing air over the aluminum to try to help blow away the debris while it was engraving. This mostly kept the dust from getting in the way of the laser. I would also periodically pause the job and brush away some of the powdered aluminum from time to time. When I talk about time, I mean a lot of time. This absolute torture test said it was going to take 88 hours to complete, and honestly, I think it probably ended up taking four straight days to complete. Again, I understand that this is an insane amount of time, but again, this experiment was all about if it could work rather than if you should do it. However, I have to say it did a really good job. The last step was to add some air vents to the mold so air could escape while injecting the plastic in the mold. I used this complete mold in my injection molding machine with my new pneumatic vise design and it really made a great model. Check out the link above if you wanna know more about that machine. I ran the injection machine and it popped out a really nice plastic part. Just look at the final product next to the 3D print of the actual model. While it's not perfect, it's really, really close. And I have to say, there is absolutely no way I would have been able to get some of the detail I got from the fiber laser with my hobby CNC machine. Now, I did make a few mistakes that I wanted to bring up. First was that when I originally started this engraving, I had the ejector pins that were made out of brass sticking out of these holes. I thought that the laser would have been able to remove the material from the aluminum and the brass at the same rate, but since aluminum is softer metal, it was engraving into it faster than it did the brass, and I didn't want the brass to get in the way of removing the aluminum, so I removed those pins. This caused another issue, which since those holes were already there in my mold blank, the laser would not only remove some of the top material surface, it would also remove some of the material that was still in focus on the inside of the holes. This slightly enlarged the holes on one side, which caused larger registration marks on the final product. I would have been much better off engraving before those holes were added. My final and most frustrating mistake took place in the last eight hours or so. After I spent some time pausing and brushing and vacuuming the debris off the mold, I forgot to turn that fan that I had placed on the inside back on. This meant for the last eight hours, there was nothing to blow away the aluminum dust, so it accumulated and blocked the laser in certain parts. 
you can see on the final product here that the dust had built up and affected that mold. Speaking of aluminum dust, you also need to be extremely careful with it. Aluminum powder is very combustible. If you do something like this, you need to be very careful and make sure you are not only not breathing this in, but you want to make sure it's not accumulating in large quantities that could catch on fire and burn almost like a welder. So why did I do this? Basically, I wanted to see if I could. At over 88 hours, this really is not a feasible project, but just imagine if the fiber laser was as powerful as my other machine, or even more powerful, then this could be a totally legitimate way to make molds for machines like this. Even a simple combination of where I CNC most of the mold and then engrave the super fine details with the fiber laser is a more legitimate workflow and could still even be done with this machine. And when it comes to the F1 Ultra, it truly was a torture test and the machine handled it very well. This machine ran at full power almost continuously for four straight days without missing a beat. I have never attempted anything like this on any of my lasers and it did great. Even after cleaning the mold, it did take a few shots to remove the dust from the mold, which is visible on the parts themselves. I wish I did a better job of cleaning it before I ran it in my machine, but it's mostly cleaned out now. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed my little experiment and it gave you some new ideas of opening up possibilities of how you can use some of these machines in new and creative ways. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button, drop a comment on what you thought, and consider subscribing for more videos on laser engraving, injection molding, 3D printing, and all things Maker. Thanks again for watching, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.